Well, let's start. Um, hey, everybody. It's me, Jim D, and there's Brett G, and I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Blooper reel. And this is Shatterbox. Shatterbox. Yep. And we're going to start, what are we, we're going to talk about weathering versus realism today or tonight or whatever it is. And, um, you know, for this right point, right, yeah, right out of the gate, I'm going to say, as I always say, and I know Brett's going to say the same thing is it's your model. Do what you want. Um, right. Just because it's something that I don't do or I don't, that style doesn't appeal to me personally for me to do right other people do it looks great right so there you go as long as you're happy, you're happy so it's my opinion on what i like to do for my kids right right um and you know for me that's that's i've i've gone full circle for me i've um, you know, start out as a kid with just gluing stuff together and maybe getting a paint or two at some point and, and um, going to painting and then, and then starting weathering and, you know, eventually getting to where you're um, doing the appreciating and the, um, you know, the dust and whatnot and, and and going through a lot of the modern techniques and, and now I'm back to um, what I call, what I would call realism versus the artistic side of things. Right. Um, you know, not that one is worse than the other or they're, but they're, to me, they're different. Um, as I was just saying with the photography, when I did photography is, you know, you had people that were very artistic and you had people that were very technical and you very rarely had somebody who was both. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, I've known uh, people like that. Yeah. And, 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 um, you know, there's, there's, um, different people see different things. Photography is, photography is a very interesting thing. If you've ever been into it for any real period of time because you could sit there and you and you'll look at something and you could see it you know and you're like give me the camera and 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 you'll have, you'll have three other people around you and they're like what is he looking at yep. <laughs> you know and you're like it's right there yeah and i think you know this is this can be the same right um, but I think for me on my journey, I've gone through that and now I'm back to trying to be more realistic than I am artistic. Right. No, that makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I would, you know, same thing here. When I started, um, probably models as a kid, you know, like I've said before, box says it's molded in color. I don't need to paint it. I just put the thing together and stick the decals on bare plastic, man. I, I, it was good. But then when I started, uh, when I got back into it in like the mid late eighties, I was in my twenties. Um, it was at the tail end of Shepard Payne, kind of like he was kind of getting, starting to get out of it some. And then uh, Francois Verlinen was the one that was coming on the scene. Right. And uh, so naturally, a lot of people are trying to emulate his work and just looking at it, you know, you look at it and it's like stuff that's never been done before. It's like, wow, that's really cool. Or that I had never seen before. Right. Looked really cool. So, you know, I had, I still have, you know, a stack of his books. And there was a lot of good things in it. And I remember even Shepard Payne uh, mentioned, um, oh, I can't remember which book it was. It was one of his last books, I think, but he mentioned, you know, Francois Verlin and his ability to dry brush just to perfection, yeah. you know, yeah. which, which oddly enough was a, a technique that was really popular and then kind of got swept under the rug with all the modern stuff, but is now making a comeback. Right. And I, I love mean, it. I'm, so do I. They're even making, yeah. you know, dry brush paints. Right. I mean, you got to have a specific thing for everything. But anyway, right. um, so that's what I was doing. And I was getting into that kind of thing. And then, uh, you know, when I got back into, you know, then I quit 
and then I got back into it 2013-ish, I think. Uh-huh. Started doing videos in 2015. I was really using the internet, reading up on stuff. That's why I'd never heard of appreciating um, the chipping, all this kind of crazy stuff. And seeing it, and then so naturally, I wanted to try and do it, and I started doing it, started doing it, started doing it, doing these different things. But then after a little while, I started looking, and I'm thinking, okay, that's a really cool technique, and that's pretty, especially when it started getting a little more exaggerated. You know, not not my stuff, but the stuff I was seeing. It's like, but is it realistic? And at that point, you know, as for me, it's like, okay, do I want to go for these really cool techniques for technique's sake? Do I want to learn these techniques just because they're cool and they look awesome? Or do I want to try and do something that's a little more quote unquote realistic on a, you know, a small bit of plastic. Right. You know, so yeah, I hear what you're saying as far as the full circle thing. Yeah. (laughs) You know, people, I mean, the, the discussion is really, um, you know, well, I shouldn't say the discussion, but you hear a lot. Well, you know, it's it's a it's you can't really shrink down light. You know the way light works and this and that. And there's there's all these reasons for doing these things. Um, the thing that I find interesting about the the whole pre shading thing, um, you know, I don't, I think a lot of us forget that that came about a long time ago. Right. And it, and it was really a way to deal with raised panel lines, which everybody hates nowadays. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but that was really, from what I remember, that is where that came from. Right. Was, how are we going to, how are we going to shadow these raised panel lines? And so that was where the whole pre-shading and then painting each panel, each individual panel with the airbrush, trying to do each individual panel. You right. Know, and it, Unless my memory's wrong, that's that's where that all started. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of I'm at the point now where, well, first I'll say, um, every sub every every subject's different. Uh-huh. And, and every airframe is different or every piece of armor is different and the paint depending on where it is and and the paint colors itself it's all different so you can't really a lot of people get into this mode of they build every single kit the same way right you know it doesn't <clears throat> matter the paint job or whatever but for for me i'm not really a appreciator anymore but there are certain things that it works on like um u.s navy tricolor Right. Or even early war with the the blue gray over gray, um, it works well with yeah. that with that paint scheme. Um, it doesn't work so good. Yeah, I've seen you know you see guys do it on like a natural metal finish or something. It's like it just it doesn't work. Not for me. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't look right. And and um, you know so so treat you got to at least for me, I have to, I treat every, try and treat everything as, it's, as a different, as a new thing, I guess, not really a new thing, right. but, um, because, you know, I, I had said before that, that, you know, I saw that show or read that book or whatever, I think it was a book, and, and the art teacher was talking to the student and said, you know, paint what you see, not what you think you see. Yeah. And, you know that's a huge concept <laughs> it sounds yeah. really simple but but you know our brains are really good at filling in the empty, empty blanks yeah and you know you have to kind of and i you know and well not to get off on a tangent but but that said i'm not really somebody that builds a photograph right i'm not um i mean i, I have reference photos and i look at them but you know, a lot of the armor guys, especially, they'll take a specific photograph and, and build, recreate that photograph. That's right. not that's not me. I don't. I I probably could do it. I just don't. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, that's the the build the building from a photograph. Um, I do that sometimes, but it depends on what it is. Yeah. Uh, 
like if I'm building a specific vehicle from a specific from a specific time period, like the M10, I've used it as, as an example before the M10 tank right. destroyer and the uh, M4A3 with the Calliope rocket launcher on it. Those were from a specific time that those vehicles were supporting my grandfather's infantry regiment. So I wanted to capture that moment in time. So that's what I did. Other right. times, like on, on this one here, there's there's photos of it, the one I'm working on, but I'm not using the photos except for like certain details, you know, like, you know, it's got these tracks on the front. I've, I've never seen that on a tiger before, but it, they did it on this one. And, you know, just certain specific things, but I'm not trying to recreate that specific level of dirtiness or cleanness or whatever, you know. Right. So it, it just, it depends on the situation for me on what I'm doing. As far as aircraft go, you know, I just kind of look at different and various uh, photos, like say I'm doing a plane and I'm working on the stuff underneath. I'll look at various photos of that particular type of aircraft. Say it's a Spitfire. I'll look at different ones to see where all the oil and junk like that would be deposited or streaked or whatever. Right. But I don't, you know, I don't try and recreate every little thing. Right. Right. Yeah. You, you, it's, it's, I think one, one place where we see a lot of, or at least where a lot of the discussion is, is with armor. Yeah. And the rust and all of this stuff. And, and, <laughs> and, and oh um, man, you know, here comes Pandora's box. But, um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, the Patton Museum out there at Cherico Summit in California out on I-10, but I remember when they were putting that place together, I used to drive by it when we go back and forth from Phoenix to, to Southern Cal, and, and um, they were just dragging stuff in out of, the, out of the target range and just kind of putting it around, and then the next thing you knew, there was a building, and then there was a museum you know and yeah but the thing is is they were pulling shermans and stuff that had been out in that desert for decades right pulling them out of the desert and parking them in this lot and they looked better than a lot of the stuff you'd see at the contest table it's like okay this thing's literally been out there for like 30 something years and, and here's a tank that's supposed to be you know operational and it looks 10 times worse than this thing that's been spitting out in the, the desert out in the elements for decades yeah <laughs> you know it's funny you, you bring that up and it's like I, I think I think part of I don't want to say yeah part of the blame is the, the the internet and for a number of reasons and you get a lot of this these theories bandied about and i don't claim to be an expert by any means because i don't know i don't know all i can tell you is how my car gets weathered and you know where rust will appear on my car right although i had a 1964 ford falcon for quite a while and the, the exhaust on it wasn't rusty it yeah. was discolored you know right. i had that like white powdery look on it but it wasn't rusted through and big chunks coming off right and um but you get these you know it's like they're wartime vehicles so they just slapped paint on them and they just threw them out in the field no I, I don't think so. No. I don't care if it was, you know, some people, well, it's the Germans, you know, they were getting bombed into oblivion. So they didn't carry, they just got them out. They're German. No, they, they, <laughs> they had, yeah, well, you're right. You know, attention to detail, but they had to be painted properly because now there are some countries, I'm not going to say the Soviet Union or anything, but there are some countries where maybe they did have the attitude. It's like, okay, we're sending them out right now. I don't care what it looks like because they're going to be plastered and just, you know, within a week or two, but we got more stacked up. That That's, that's our goal, <laughs> you know, right. disposable stuff. Well, 
the Germans weren't going to make disposable stuff because they were running out. I, I would think again, I'm not this big expert and just kind of common sense stuff and things I've read. They're not going to make stuff that's going to just fall apart intentionally or just, I don't know. It just, the, the, some people say that, well, you know, they were only out there for a few weeks or a couple of months before they were destroyed. So they didn't care. Well, that's, that could be partially true, but not all the time. So it's not like they're just going to slap dash stuff together. And then, so, but on the flip the, side of it, the, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, if they had that kind of attitude, you know, it's like, okay, well, maybe they would be that rusty and nasty looking after, you know, but, you know, you got the, the one side of the coin where they're only out there for a few months, so it, it should show hardly show anywhere at all except on maybe sheet metal stuff. And then there's the other side where it's like, you know, it's like they're just going to rust like crazy, you know, like they've been sitting out in the field for the last 20 years. You know, it's like it's kind of it's kind of out of context. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. That was yeah. a lot of blabbering for nothing, yeah. I think. <laughs> Well, I got the only thing that I was going to say about that was, you know, and again, this is my opinion. And, and yeah, I've done a little bit of business with some small German companies over the years and B2B stuff. <coughs> and, and they're, um, they're tough, <laughs> you know, yeah. they know what they want, even when they're not, when they don't know what they want. Right. <laughs> and, and, uh, I won't say any more, but, um, and, um, I, to, in my head, if they had that mentality of just, we just, it, we don't have time to do it right. Let's just do it. Just get some stuff built. Uh, the, the tiger would have never happened. Right. You know, and, and the, and the tiger too, and maybe even the Panther would have never happened. Right. This is why, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and, the, and the, and the 262 and the 163 and the, and all you know that stuff would have never happened, but yeah. But anyway, um, well, you saying what you said about them being sitting out in that field and all that kind of stuff, okay? There are, like you said, there there's kits that are weathered to a point that they look worse than those vehicles that sat out in a field. Mm -hmm. You know, now there's obviously there's certain things that are going to rust, you know, in connectors, you know, track links, you know, uh, exhaust, stuff like that. But in general, the vehicle, I mean, it's going to look kind of weather faded from sun beating down on it and everything else, you know, and just scouring from wind storms or whatever. But just the just the 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 streams of rusty streaks down the side. Yeah. You know, and again, to me this is where it gets this is where you know some people get kind of offended here's the thing if that's the way you want your model to look what? more power to you I, again i can look at a model like that and think holy cow i could never do i could never i could i probably could but i might not be able to create something that looks like that the the, the techniques that are used they look you cool look you know it. they look really good and and it looks you know what the, here's what it boils down to the thing that the thing that they were shooting for they achieved yeah you know right. and again that's not to say it's right or wrong because you know that's the way they want their model to look and more power to you for me getting back like you said going full circle i'm at a point where i, I think i would like to to concentrate more on realism right as opposed to being able to do certain techniques now if i had opportunity like i was doing a specific vehicle that you know had been knocked out and was sitting in a forest that somebody forgot about you know and they found it last week right right then right. okay then i'm, I'm going to go for those type of but that's realistic for that particular case right you know it's context right yeah, it, it's it's um yeah, I mean you just said it and, and we said it at the beginning, well, and it's the title, you know, it's it's important during this discussion to realize that that weathering 
that it's it's really two different subjects. It's weathering and it's realism. Right. And and, the, and now the sometimes person, they uh, can they can intersect. Yeah, yeah, no, no. There yeah. are cases. Yeah. You know, Re- but by and large, realism always has weathering, but weathering is noise realism. How's that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, um, you know, you're talking about the 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 model that's it's got all the stuff and all the techniques and this and that and the other thing and 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 um th- there's nothing wrong with that there, there's right there's not you know um and it's um, everybody watching hear me <laughs> right I'm, I'm not bagging on anybody's work or or a particular style of work it's just i'm talking about for myself right so you know it's I, that I honestly, my opinion, <laughs> I honestly think a lot of this stuff came into vogue. Strike a pose, never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> came into vogue to sell product. I honestly believe that. I, I have no doubt in my mind that it's like, and, and it's it's artistry. It is. I'm not saying it's not. Right. You know, but but at some point you cross you cross the threshold of realism and you get into um, into pure artwork. And, and, right. And that's fine. And that's fine. Well, you know, a, a good example of that, and this goes along with the product and the people who sell the product. Yeah. Um, I remember when I first got back uh, into. And I think it just happened to be that those were the channels I was watching at the time or that those were the groups that I was looking in on and joining and, you know, learning things and all this kind of stuff. Uh, the quote unquote Spanish school or whatever you want to yeah. call it. Yeah. Um, like I'll, I don't want to mention any names because I don't want people thinking I'm bagging on, but right. there's uh, like for instance, the the one that the one one of the ones that just will create no end of turmoil in a discussion uh, on a forum or something is Panzer Gray. Yeah. You know, yeah. the real Panzer Gray it was a really dark, almost black gray. Yeah. And when you see it in photos, and right. it's like looks kind of light, it's exposure, it's covered in dust, it's right. slopped up mud, whatever. It was a really dark looking gray, and um. But there was people who liked to stylize that. They would right. add blues to it and it would make all these different. Uh, and and f- for this particular style of painting, it's perfect with the German vehicles because they're so angular. You know, you right. got like Stugs or um, Panzer IVs, whatever. They're so angular and they have so many, you know, uh, straight edges and stuff like that okay. and, and joins. You know, they're, they're using uh, post-it notes to mask and, and painting, you know, one panel, one color and fading it to a light color and everything. And the techniques are, I mean, in all honesty, they're dro- jaw dropping when you look at them. It's like, holy smokes. Right. I mean, that looks, it looks unreal in a couple of different ways, you know. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought of that. It's like, it looks really, really cool. But is but it realistic? Understanding what in it my eyes, to do that gives you an appreciation for it exactly bingo yeah. that's it you know it's like i i i i one of one of the techniques that always cracked me up was uh um and i i never did it myself but like like say you're doing a 30 uh, panzer 38t right with all the rivets or anything with a lot of rivets you know they right. paint the base color they do all their shading and all that kind of stuff and then they take an ultra light version of the color and pick out each individual rivet in small detail Right. It's like, well, you know, you can kind of almost do that with dry brushing, yeah. <laughs> you know, right. but, yeah. you know, when you put the washes on it and you do some wet, I, it just really, as a lot of people like to say, it makes details pop, right? And yeah. it does. And you can see every flipping detail on that tank and right or wrong, it looks really, really, really cool. Right. But right. is it realistic? And that's the thing, you know, it's like, you got the people that like to do realism and the people that like to do uh, artistic. Uh, more artistic kind yeah. of, you know, kind of thing. And you, sometimes you get a lot of, 
important. It's just not, that's not really necessary, but yeah, you know, yeah, it, it just depends on what you want to do yourself. And honestly, you know, in certain instances, they're, they really meld into each other because, and I'm thinking particularly whitewashes. Right. Um, on armor. If you go, well, first of all, let me talk about Panzer Gray real quick. You know, I think some of the discussion um, that came along about Panzer Gray is I think a lot of people had a hard time believing that Panzer Gray really was what it was. Right. Yeah, you know, and it's like, well, why would they do that? Well, the reason they would paint something basically black is because they had no competition. Right. It didn't matter. They didn't have to hide. Right. <laughs> you know, they really had no competition. Um, you know, and, and another thing that people forget is even up through, you know, most of Barbarossa and the Russian campaign, I mean, they were still a horse-drawn army. They were still yeah. a livery army and and you know, yeah, they had vehicles, but they had a lot of horses. Yep. And stuff. So, but anyway, going on, go, coming back to the, the whitewash thing, um, you look at different models and you'll see lots of different techniques to do whitewashes. And honestly, they're all right because if you go back and you look at period photos of them doing whitewashes, and you'll see the ones that are like where the whitewash is almost totally gone, you know, and it's all distressed. Mm -hmm not well if you go back you can go back and find period photos where they've actually they're whitewashing the tank and it looks like that as they're whitewashing it because they've got the stuff so diluted because they don't have enough right <laughs> right so they've diluted the crap out of it excuse my language right you know, to get coverage and 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 it looks and it 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 basically turns a panzer gray tank into a mouse gray tank right you know it's not white by any means um, well, and, yeah, and it wasn't. It wasn't the whitewash. It, wasn't really like a uh, an actual paint, was it? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just asking. Yeah. Or was it more like whitewash, where it was, you know, some water diluted mess they put on there, and right. it, the more it rained and the more it snowed, started washing it off. Well, I don't. I don't know. I'm just, you know. Uh, I'm not convinced of that. I mean, maybe that was true in some cases, but if you look at some of the vehicles. Um, especially in 42, I think, and look at some of the pictures, like, um, I mean, those vehicles are white. They're white. Yeah. They're not right. gray. They're white, <laughs> you know, and, and, they, and they're well covered. And yeah, they'll have streaks, but, I, you know, and maybe some of them are from, from water and stuff, but I think a lot of it's just where they left some of the gray coming through or something rubbed off i mean like you right. know like i said i don't know i wasn't there but yeah but um me neither point being there's this whole gamut of whitewash you know from literally literal white tanks to these mouse gray um, yeah and i'm using mouse gray as in like the uniform color because i don't know what right to say, but right but um you know they had the, the winter uniform you had the white on one side and the mouse gray on the on the other but um you know and and but i yeah i, I mean i remember one photo where these guys, where they're putting the, the whitewash on and i think it's on a panzer three or something and it's so diluted that it's only actually catching on like the edges right they're, they're putting <laughs> it on with rags they're putting it on with rags and it's only catching on the edges of the of the plates and stuff, you know, and it's just yeah. the rest of the tank into like a, it looks like somebody's just rubbing it with white gesso paint, you know. Or it looks like something like, uh, you know, a person like us has taken their modeling paint and thinned it too much and then sprayed it on their model. Yeah, and it just kind of collects in the, uh, in the details instead of giving you even coverage no idea what you're i'm not about. saying i've done that recently or anything but you know just just saying yeah no, no <laughs> idea what you're talking about never done that <coughs> um but you know i th i honestly think you know again going back to, to my opinion on things is i honestly think most of the weathering that you see on armored vehicles in world war ii and, and even modern day is is dust 
<laughs> you know? Well, that's true. Uh, you know, I, I, what, like I said, when I first got back into it, I'm trying all these techniques and stuff, right? I was building the, uh, was it Academy? Or no, maybe it was Hobby Boss. The uh, M3 Stuart Honey yeah. kit. Been around for a long time, but it, it's a really nice little kit. Um, and I was doing it in the contour scheme. First time I ever, I ever did a contour scheme, you know, desert vehicle, all this kind of stuff. And I got it painted and I'd been reading some stuff about chipping and all these other techniques and all. And I started chipping it and stuff. And it was the sponge technique. You know, I've never, I'd never done that before. And I started doing it along the edges. I'm thinking, Hey, that looks pretty cool. And I got done with that. I'm thinking, man, that looks awesome. You know, but then further down the road, you know, I'm looking at pictures of the real vehicle. It's like, man, over chipped much, <laughs> you know, but I got so into it and I was so stoked I could do that technique and it looked, you know, halfway decent, you know, but then it's like, well, that shouldn't have been like that, you know? Right. right. But, you know, the flip side of that is, is I did a 222 armored car or something, Africa core thing. And, and I put, some, I, I, I put some rust on the chassis on the bottom. And somebody yeah. was looking at it and they're like, that thing's not going to rust in the desert. And it's like, how much of your life have you lived in the desert? Because <laughs> I can tell you for a fact, things rust in the desert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they don't, you know, they don't rust through typically, but they rust. Right. Um, yeah, you just, it's, it's, I think a lot of the, I think a lot of it, I say that a lot, don't I? I think a lot of it comes too from the fact that there's this real problem with the human psyche, in my opinion, where we automatically think that the generations before us were just way stupider than we are. And they didn't have all this cool stuff that we have. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. and, and it's like, really, have you ever like looked at the Parthenon and stuff? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. You know? uh, but, but, um, you know, and, and there's this idea that, well, you know, that was, a, well, 80 years ago now, you know, and, and I mean, what is it? It's almost, it is almost, it's, in a couple of years, it will be a hundred years since they started spray painting cars on the production yeah. line. Up until then, yeah. they were brush painted. Up until, yeah. the, up until like the mid 20s. Yeah. Brush painting cars coming off the assembly line, you know, yeah. and, and it wasn't brush painting it was they would they would literally like put the paint on paint and it was like pigment and gasoline right put that on rub it out and then and then varnish it you know i mean it yeah. was a, it was a major process you yeah. know and all of a sudden somebody came up with a spray gun hey watch this <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, they were like, "Oh, we like that," but, but um, you know, and then and then, well, you you found that picture earlier today of that Sherman in that big oven getting the paint baked on it, right? Well, you know, the <clears throat> just the Sherman is is a good example, like the the photo you sent today. It's like yowza, you know, yeah, and yeah. from from a lot of the stuff that you know, I've read and, you know, again, I wasn't there. I don't know for sure. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence or whatever, but the paint that was used on U S vehicles, especially tanks was just like high quality stuff. And it didn't chip so much as it wore from the well, stuff I've heard and read. Right. And it's funny because in one of uh, Mike Rinaldi's books, he talks about that, and when he weathers uh, U.S. vehicles, he doesn't he doesn't chip them up. He puts a dark olive drab underneath of whatever brand. I think he uses Hataka first because of a different shade, right. and then he paints the other whatever it is over top of that. And he basically just instead of chipping through it, he kind of wears it down a little bit to right. give it kind of a you know like like if you 
if you sit a long time on a certain spot of a piece of metal and you're rubbing a cloth on it a lot, it's going to, it's going to burnish it and make it look different than the surrounding paint. You're changing the luster you know? when you are the color. Pretty much. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and he talks about that whenever he, you know, whenever he's weathering, you know, a U.S. vehicle, you know, he doesn't chip it, right. you know, he just, well, I think he we just have wears it, he wears it down. You I know. have to remember they were mainly, I mean, all that there was was enamels and lacquers. Right. You know, they weren't, they, they were pretty tough, tough products. They weren't, right. uh, you know, and, and I mean, we didn't have the EPA running around. Oh, you shouldn't breed that, you know. Yeah, uh, no kidding. <laughs> yep. How about it, fellas? That wasn't happening. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, I think you, you know Shep Payne said in the in in the one of the two books that um, that they were mixing that that paint paste. The Germans would mix that paint paste with gasoline, right? And 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 that sounds odd, but honestly, if my memory serves me correctly, I think that's what they were doing in the U.S. auto factories prior to to spraying, right? Um, you know, like in the teen, in the tens, in the teens, in the twenties. Well, I think it's just. I think they. I think that's exactly what they were doing. It's just another petroleum-based product that you know right. you you happen to be able to burn in a car to make it go. Right, right, yeah, you know. So I mean, um, so I don't know, you know, but but um, I think the Sherman too, you know, is, is a good example of. You know, talking about the thing only lasting for weeks or whatever, you know, there's, there's, um, we had a couple of guys in our club that were kind of Sherman aficionados. One of them's no longer with us, unfortunately, but, um, and, and they had both, you know, come across information about, um, you know, forward depots and stuff that were, you know, a Sherman would get knocked out and they drag it in and th they literally wash it out with a with a hose or with a fire hose and weld the holes up and slap a coat of paint on it and issue it to a new crew. Um, that's, that's what the Sherman was made for. Right, Reliability right. and just replace some components and boom, there you go. You're ready right, to roll again. Right. You know, so, um, you know, in paint. You know, we also have to remember that paint was um, was really corrosion resistance as much as anything else. Right. You know, yeah. It, it's a protective thing. Um, yep. So, you know, the, the idea that, that it was just falling off in sheets and stuff is like. Right. Big chips uh, and chunks out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Because, I mean, look at, if you look at. Um, photos of of penetrations and look at the paint around those penetrations and and yeah has some of the paint chipped off in some cases yeah there'll be a, a piece of paint flake or flaked off you know maybe at one edge of the penetration or whatever but a lot of times that paint's intact right you know, just scorched right, a little bit and yeah, yeah. You know, went right through it and that paint's still yeah. on there <laughs> so yeah <laughs> so I don't know, you know, but but um, in an aircraft, you know, it's it's um, again, you know, it's aircraft. I think you you get a lot of aero specific stuff, and and you get different. Um, I think a lot of stuff we see, especially in the modern grays and stuff is is differences in the actual grays and not so much fading and whatnot i think just differences in paint batches right or or, or just lighting or, or whatever yeah. and and um well it it seems like a lot, a lot of modern stuff it's like a whole lot more staining you know from different fluids and well there's you know, that. other things like that yeah, and there's that, and then you know, particularly on Navy aircraft. I don't know how it is now, but I know in the '80s and whatnot, it was, you know, it was 
they just touch stuff up with rattle cans. They had rattle cans of FS number. Yeah. Yep. And they'd go out there and they'd fix something and go, oh, we got to touch this up and get a can. And yeah. And okay, fly it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's how they ended up, you know, they'd come back from their deployment and, you know, those planes looked great when they left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they don't look so good now, but they look great when they left. And, and, you know, again, you know, I'm not, not beating up on anybody. It's just, it's, it's, like I said, I'm coming full circle, you know, yeah. it's, it's, for me, it's, it's, it's trying to get it more realistic than it is getting it artistic. And, and, you know, right now I'm building these three of these to me, a P47 D D's and I'm, I'm, um, if I can find some, I want to do an RAF one if I can find some decals, but, um, you know, there's at least one of them is probably going to end up as natural metal. And a lot of the stuff that you're seeing built now that's natural metal is super shiny. Yeah. You know, and it's like, okay, I guess if you're building a warbird, that's fine. But um, actually, what I'm going to try the next natural metal finish is I got the Tamiya, what is this, the AS12 or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, the AS12. And I'm going to use that for my base, and then I'm going to do panels and alclad over top of it. Right. And see and see how that works. But, um, you know, again, that's something where you see it done multiple ways. You see the pre-shading. You see people just pick into individual panels and, and, and do different shades and whatnot. And the reality is, is, is you can take you know, three, four, three natural metal P-47s, wartime P-47s, and put them next to each other. And the, the panels on this P-47 that are, you know, a different shade or whatever are going to be the same ones on the, on the one next to it. Right. You know, they're, they're, <clears throat> they're, they're not just, it's not just random. Yeah. You know, like on the P-51, you got that one panel on the exhaust that's stainless or whatever. Right. You know, it's it's. I mean, it's because it's it's a different material. That's why it's a, that's yeah. why it's different. You know, so, you mentioned the panel thing. Um, <clears throat> I wrote it down so I won't forget. Continue. Okay. Oh, I was just I was just saying. You know, that's um, and I've done it both ways. You know, I I have just. I have just picked panels and done whatever I wanted and, and I've gone and, and done it and, you know, looked at the picture and got the right pan, the panels that were supposed to be different, different. And, and it, it looks fine either way, honestly. Um, but, you know, the, 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 there's an idea out there, you know, that, especially with P-51s that, you know, they, the crews were polishing them and whatnot to get more speed out of them and whatnot. And, and they were, but, you know, they didn't have like buffing compound and a right buffer. And, you know, it's, it's, it's anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the, the panel thing, you know, you mentioned that and um, I've, I've built aircraft kits kind of both ways. Again, it's, it's that going full circle thing like you're talking about to where, <clears throat> you know, it's basically one color, <clears throat> whatever. And I'm talking about, you know, metal finish. Well, even, even painted finishes, but um then I've tried, you know, doing certain panels, different colors and stuff like that. And it's, you know, some, sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it does, but a lot of times you'll hear, you'll hear the, again, you know, it's going to sound bad to people who do it, but you'll hear, you know, it's like, well, I, I'm doing this to add visual interest. It's like, 
Well, visual interest is cool as long as it kind of makes sense, you know? Right, right. Um, it's like it's like you take a you take a you know a war bird and it, you know it's pretty stinking interesting to begin with, right. and I, I don't think it needs to be embellished too much. Right. Um, like w- an example here, I, I read about this one not too long ago. Somebody was talking about they were uh, gonna be painting the um, the access doors for the ammo bins in a wing okay and they painted them a certain way that did not match the wing yet it made complete sense yeah because it's a totally removable panel it gets thrown on the ground greasy hands are putting it back and that's the way he painted it you know it was metal it was bare metal but the panel you know it was i can't remember the aircraft but the it went up underneath and it was cool because he had painted it and he had masked around it and then he did some like oil work on it or whatever. So it right. looked like greasy hands have been handling that panel and put it in place. Right. You know, right. It made sense, but right. just like a random panel on the side of an aircraft that nobody ever touches for any reason, right. Right. just to right. paint it a different color, just to add visual interest. It's like, right. I, I understand where the person is going with it, but it's kind of, um, not going in the right direction if that makes sense oh, you know so it, it's not it's not a panel that that is you know removed and put on and removed or opened or whatever it's just a panel that happens to have rib, you know rivets or whatever around it because you know during the assembly process and that's probably the last time it was touched but you have right. to paint it a different color right it's so uh, of metal yeah. of metal right it's subject matters i mean stuff like that subject matter specific i mean right something that comes to 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 mind right off the bat for me is on a corsair a 40 corsair um you know you'll always see the ring roots all chipped up and whatnot and the reality is if you look at photos i mean not that they're not chipped up but the reality is if you look at the photos right up toward the the front part of the wing cord where the those the radio the oil coolers and radiators are in, in the in the leading edge that's where the paint's all worn off and the reason the paint's all worn off there is that's where the guys were standing when they were taping the seams and stuff on the fuel tanks because they were leaking all the time that white tape that you see yeah white lines on those corsairs it's that's tape because the fuel tanks and the oil tanks are crap leaked right so they would tape them to keep it off of the windscreen yeah well if you look at corsair photos the the <laughs> forward portion of that wing right next to the to those panels yeah the paint's all worn off because they were constantly up there putting tape on right you know that makes sense that, that's that well it, it may not make sense but if you know that it makes sense right you know um so yeah but 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 the idea that that you know the the that there there's there's just the paint's going to be worn off of the the wings on every single airplane because people are walking on it. Mm, you know, I, I mean, they touched them up, they painted them, <laughs> you know, they, they went in for maintenance and, and uh, I mean, granted, it depends on the theater too. You know, if you're talking the South right. Pacific and you're talking Marine Corps aircraft, you know, you're looking, yeah. you had oil and stuff, let alone paint, but yeah. Yeah. And, and the Marines didn't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah know, marines they don't care yeah <laughs> it don't it don't have to look good it just has to work yeah but, um, exactly as long as the guns work and the engine works you're good to go <laughs> right, right but um well you know i i um you know pa- the paint finish thing remember i told you about that uh when i was doing some research into my um you know one of the units that my uncle would have been an air controller for in vietnam uh right. vmf 323 Right. There's a really good documentary on YouTube about them in 66 over there in Vietnam. And it's funny because, you know, you got these in theater uh, F4s and, you know, yeah, they look somewhat worn and everything, but it showed them, you know, uh, connecting underneath. I don't know if they feel them from underneath or what, but they were, were connected okay. underneath 
and you could see gloss paint. It was gloss oh. paint. You know, it wasn't all dull and nasty looking, you know. Now, I'm sure there was parts of the aircraft that were like that. But, you know, the thing was just beat the tarnation and, you know, shot. Uh, But, you know, granted, it was kind of early on in in the involvement over there. But the Air Force ones are pretty beat up, some of them. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know whether that may have been just because. No, I don't know. I, I but it just seems like, you know, with the, the Air Force ones, it was mainly the F-4s and the 105s that really had pain issues. But I can yeah. Do yeah. The, the, you know, the Navy that, that well, I mean, they had a, the gloss gray and the gloss white. I mean, they were gloss, yeah. you know. So, right, right. Um, yeah, I don't know. My father-in-law was a, were, they were a Diné, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. My father-in-law was at Da Nang at 66 in the Air Force, and uh, the friend of friend of ours, the guy that owns the 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 embroidery shop that did the hats and stuff for me, he's yeah, he was there at Da Nang. He was a Marine Corps. He yeah, was a, he was a grunt there in '66. So all three of them guys were probably there together. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was funny. So we found that out, and we got him and my brother, my father-in-law, together. You know, it's like you guys, you guys were there at the same time, just on the other opposite side of the base. Yeah. But um, anyway. You know, uh, it, it all, a lot of it has to do with, uh, I think you said this earlier today. A lot of it is research, yeah. you know, and knowing what for a specific You know, if you're doing a specific aircraft or a specific vehicle, you know, and you're trying to make it as realistic as possible, you got to look at them pictures, you know, and, and, and and discern what you can from an old black and white photo, you know, that's something else. And, you know, you kind of have to take into context, especially, especially if it's something that, you know, um, like if, if you're modeling an aircraft that was, you know, only in combat for a month before it was shot down right. well if you model that thing it's going to be pretty it's going to be in pretty good shape you yeah. know it's going to have some dust on it it might have some you know fuel and, and oil leaks here and there right but it's not just going to be just a tattered mess no and, and you know and that's that's i mean that kind of brings up another thing that i think you know people forget is you know, when you started getting into late 44 and whatnot, um, as far as the fighters go, there really wasn't a whole lot for them to do. That's why they were down on the ground shooting up tanks and stuff, because the Luftwaffe was pretty much done. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, they, they were, we could put so many aircraft up in the sky that there wasn't anything for the fighters to do. Right. You know, and, and. And uh, um, well, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but, but, um, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? I was just, when I was ta- talking about that, I was thinking about Dottie May, that P 47 that they pulled out of that lake or whatever in the Netherlands a few years back. And yeah. And, oh, I know what it was now thinking about, but um, you know, that thing was in great shape. Great yeah. shape. You know, and 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 um um I think that's kind of a testament to really what was going on at that part point in the war is you know, the fighter pilots were probably a little bored. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. these really long missions going, there's nothing for us to do. Yep. You know, and 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 I think you know the misnomer is too that that people some people have the idea that these planes were flying continuously and they weren't. No, you know, they, there they, might have been like like well, Spitfires, Hurricanes, all that kind of stuff, Battle of Britain time. Yeah, yes. they were coming in long enough to day. yeah, you know, they get the truck running down the runway. A plane would touch down and kind of get next to them. They'd dump some gas in it. And they'd... <laughs> yeah. 
I'm being oh, dumb. Yeah, but, yeah. but, you know, almost. I mean, they'd stop, refuel, rearm, let's go. Right. You know, unless something was broke and they couldn't. And even then, it was like, it better be really broke to keep it grounded. But Right. I was going to talk about this cockpit, talking about weathering, and you can't see it. But I did I put up photos on Instagram um, if you want to see them. And I think they're on the Shutter Ace page, the Facebook page. They should be. Um, but what I was going to say, so I went a little bit different on these cockpits. And what I did, is, as you know, is I have the ultimate, um, I should have it right here, ultimate weathering wash. This yep. stuff. Sorry, my lighting's not. I've, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, this is the light dirt. But what I did, you know, the standard thing with a cockpit is people do a wash and, and then they dry brush it and they, they chip the hell out of the floor and whatnot. And I've always been like, not buying it, you know? And, yeah. And um, so. And I mean, I don't know. I've never really, I can't say that I've ever seen the cockpit floor, a picture of the cockpit floor of a wartime B-47. Yeah. I don't even know if there is such a thing. There might be. But so what I did with these was, first of all, I did the cockpit as kind of my standard way, which base colors, dry brushing, um, go back in, paint some details. And rather than use uh, an oil wash, I use this clay-based light dirt wash. Way more realistic in my opinion, way more realistic. This looks like dirt on the damn floor. Like when your kids track mud in the house. That's, you know what? Um, <laughs> that's, that's right. And that's one of the reasons why I really ended up liking that stuff. Now I, I use it in conjunction with other things a lot of times, especially right. on like armored vehicles. But the first time I used it, I think it was on that, um, that four wheel. What is it? Is it the 221? That four wheel German armored car that's got the little turret. And a twenty millimeter gun in it. It's like oh, a recon yeah. type vehicle. Uh, that was, I did that one a long time ago, and I painted in Panzer Gray. And that was the first time. As a matter of fact, it was one of my early uh, plastic models for beginners series. Yeah. And I used that clay wash because I'd seen it demonstrated, and I started thinking about it. And I thought, hey, that kind of makes sense because you slather that stuff on there. And where's it going to stick? It's going to stick in the places you can't wipe it off, which is like in corners and along edges right. and around hinges. And it looks yeah. like built up deposited dirt. Now, you can do the same thing really with, um, you know, uh, a buff colored wash and stuff like yeah. that. But, but the thing I like about this is the fact that, number one, there's no chemicals involved. Right. And it also leaves a bit of a dusty appearance on the paint finish, especially if you're using yes. like an ultra flat paint, like Tamiya, yeah. like an oil wash. I got to gloss it or else I fail doing, right. you know, like an oil wash because it just dissipates, you know, it just, uh, it just kind of like bleeds out into the surrounding flat right. surface. Whereas with that stuff, you put it on there, you can rub it off and you can rub it off to varying degrees to where you get a nice, dusty, dirty look, you know. It has, it has depth. It has body. Right. It's not like you're just coloring it. It's like there's actually a buildup deposit of like yeah. scale sized pile of dirt in a corner. It looks like dirt because it is dirt. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well said <laughs> but somebody just the other day i was looking at um i can't remember who it was man I, I i've seen so much of this stuff but somebody was doing an interior on an interior that that's a good uh that's a good topic oh wait we already did that one um <laughs> he's doing an interior on a tank right on, on a some german tank 
And I was watching what he was doing and he was just like slopping on the mud on the floor. And I'm looking at that and it's like, that, that looks good because th- what he was doing is he was pushing it up against the, the, the rim of the turret basket and up against the, the, the sidewalls of the driver's spot, right. you know, right. He's getting mud on the floor and it's getting kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked and it's building up in those corners. It wasn't just chipped down right. to bare metal, you right. know. Now, if anybody's going to chip it down to bare metal, it would probably be the Germans or the uh, uh, British because they're stinking hobnailed boots that they insisted on wearing, you know, with those big right. metal chunks in the bottom. But, you know, it instead of going down to the metal and, you know, doing that number, it was full of dirt and mud. And I was like, man, that, that, looks, that looks spot on. It looked really good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you know, I think I I think this is actually a good a good um, example of you know one way you're doing it is one way. What am I trying to say? Kind of doing this, trying to get the same effect, but using two different products and really getting two different effects. One right. being much more artistic than the other. Right. Um, you know, I think that the the. the well, I don't know. I think for me, for a while, like I said, that the chip, the, the, the idea of the paint being rubbed off the floor in the cockpit, just it doesn't work for me in my head. Yeah, so it doesn't. <laughs> you know, and, you know, and I, I, you know, I, I, I do, do you, that. I mean, go ahead. I was gonna say I do do that sometimes, like especially on the rudder pedals and stuff like that, yeah. where there's constant yeah. friction, maybe yeah. a little bit near the thing. But to me, the biggest areas where there's going to be chipping, if any, is where something that the pilot is wearing that's metal is going to get scraped going in and out of the aircraft. Right. You know, little chips of paint here and there. It's not going to be this just, right. you know, slit like somebody took a hammer to it or whatever, you know? So, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying as far as, you know, it's like. I think we have to remember that they did paint the cockpits. Yeah. You know, and and, 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 and it's. I think there's this, you know, there's this idea at some point that once this thing came out of the factory, nobody ever touched it. Yeah. You know, other than the other than the make sure it was still flying. And it's like, well, that's not really true. You know, it's, it's yeah. It, except for the Marines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but you, you know, it's it's, uh, you know, I mean, the Navy, the Navy is always painting stuff. You know, they have yeah. to. They have to. Um, and and you know they they um, interestingly enough, at least on some aircraft, they were painting the cockpits in black, right? You know, or at yeah. least part of the cockpit in black and and, and different things. So, you know, it, a lot of times you hear that because um, there there's some people that that do some that I I, I don't want to say they're extreme in their weathering. They just choose subjects that have extreme weathering yeah so they can practice extreme weathering they're really careful in what they pick because that's what they like doing you know it's like we had talked in one of the early things it's like you know there's a lot of builders that it's like okay yeah i want it to me kid so i can just throw this thing together and get it done and i want it to look right so i can get on with the paint and the weathering right but they're doing specific things for a specific reason and people will jump all over well, no, no self-respecting crew chief would allow that to happen. Okay, here's the thing. Now, I'm not in the military. I never have been. But I've read a lot of stuff. I've seen a lot of stuff. And I've known military people. Okay. The crew chief, make sure that plane's running right and that any complaints with hydraulics or pressures or whatever is getting right. taken care of. And make sure those flipping weapons work. Those right. are the things that are going to keep them alive, right. not you know rubbing all the paint off and polishing the polishing the aluminum and all that kind of stuff. Right. You know you can't you can't sell me on that. That, that is even during peacetime. I mean, you look at some of these modern aircraft, and they're not covered in mud or anything, but right. you can get them that look pretty pretty stinking shabby. <laughs> yeah. You know. But do they always look shabby like that, even oh. a particular aircraft? No, because I've seen photos of big 
like washing racks that they push them through. Oh, right. You know, so I'm sure I'm sure they do that kind of stuff occasionally. But, you know, for like you said, you know, for most of the time, it's like, you know, there, there's a bunch of paint bubble. But it's like, all right, get spray can. It's like, great. Good. Well, <laughs> you, know? you know, you have to remember it's an asset. Yeah, you know, they can't just let it go to pot. Right. You know, it's it's an asset. It, it's expensive too, you know, it's an expensive asset. Yeah. And, and honestly, nowadays, probably it's even more critical now because you know, not only are the are the are the weapon systems, the platforms getting more expensive, but they're getting fewer and fewer of them, you know, as time goes right. on. And, and and that's a whole different discussion for me because that kind of you know, I, 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 I always think back to, to World War II and, and the Soviet, you know, idea of just building a bunch of, a lot of inexpensive, low-tech stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and the reality is, is we were doing the same thing. You know, the Sherman really was not much different than the T-34 when it comes to that. It's like, you know what? It's not the greatest thing out there, but it does the job and we can build them really fast. Right. For the job it was supposed to do, it was perfect. Right. You know, you so know? so that, you know, that might be a fun discussion to have one of these days. It just really doesn't have anything to do with modeling, but the whole idea of sophisticated, a lot of, a few sophisticated weapon systems versus a whole ton of unsophisticated weapon systems. Yeah, right. Yeah. Which would you rather have? Yeah. I'm kind of into the <laughs> thing myself. It seems to have worked in the past. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, okay. what is that what's that line in red dawn when they find the, the f-15 pilot and the and the girl says you got shot down she's like all on his case because he got shot down he's like hey there was five of them i got four of them or something like that <laughs> four of them before they got me cut me some slack <laughs> but anyway oh wow I don't know how long we've been yapping about it. Uh, we've been right at about an hour. Oh, well, By the time we got the kinks worked out at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot yeah. to turn the recorder on for those who want to know. Yeah. Uh, but Well, in, yeah. in summation for me, if, if we're calling it here, um, there, you know, there, there's, there's a balance. Um, no, not really. I just, you know, just... Uh, if, like you, I'm, I'm kind of coming around full circle, um, trying to, I'm trying to get, trying to get a balance between the two worlds, something that looks realistic yet, you know, uh, I guess it depends on a, a lot of it depends on, on what you're, what you're shooting for too, because I mean, you look at somebody like Paul Budzik, I know I bring him up yeah. almost every time, but I mean, the dude is a flipping wizard. Yeah. But he does absolutely no weathering at all of any kind. I mean, the stuff he's building looks like it just rolled out of the boathouse, rolled out of the hangar, rolled out of the factory. You right. know, but he's he comes from that time period whenever he was really doing a lot of stuff. I mean, I guess he's been around forever. Um, where uh, he's doing whenever like you enter them articles in the 70s, I think, yeah, right, yeah, you know, he's got these models that you know he's just always built them. Uh, I, I don't know if he actually built them for contests, but for contests back in the day, because you know, yeah. it's you know, it's just there wasn't any weathering i mean i remember looking in magazines even even when i was you know younger you having the modeling magazines and seeing you know it's like big model contests so if you look at the models they, they didn't have weathering and stuff on them the only time they ever had weathering and you know battle damage and stuff like that was if they were on a diorama right you know it wasn't you know here's my model for this thing it's like you built it you painted it and it looked it looked factory fresh and i think you know things have kind of changed through the years to where well things are different things are a lot different you know I, and i think that's that's something that really gets lost is is you know back in those days you were dealing with pretty basic kids yeah you know? and 
And I, you know, I know people get tired of hearing us old guys talk about monogram, but but the reality is, is monogram was one of the of, of the of the companies that were actually putting interiors in things. They were probably much better at it than anybody else, right? At the time, and and you have to remember, it's a time when a lot of kits still didn't have it. Aircraft kits, there was no interior. Nothing. You're lucky if you got a seat to put the pilot on. Usually yeah, it was you know, just like I mean, a little the, post that you poked him on yeah, on the back, the, you know. The instrument panel was literally on the decal sheet and you were just supposed to cut it out, leave it on the paper and glue it yeah. into the cockpit, you know. Yep. So so those guys were, were literally scratch building cockpits and wheel wells because that there was none of that stuff. Right. And, and um, I think that it's that that gets get that gets forgotten you know yeah. so 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 yeah i mean i can kind of see you know i just spent all this time building all this all these little bits and pieces and stuff i'm not gonna hide it under a bunch of mud and you know dirt and 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 whatever. that's a good point and, yeah. and not only that but you know we've got it we've got it pretty easy now i mean yep. we you know and and now we can actually spend the time on on the, I guess the creative part of the hobby used to be creating all those details and that has now shifted to the paint. I just thought about that. That is, that is pretty stinking good. So the creation, the creative part has just shifted to the finishing. Right. Rather than the construction, but you know, yep. if, if you, if you, you know, read Paul's stuff and whatnot, his thing, he will tell you, and he says it more than once usually is he's all about the shape. That's his A number one. First thing mm -hmm. is, is it, is the shape right? Yeah. And, I don't, and that doesn't make him a rivet counter. He's just, he's, that's really what he likes. On, yeah. You know, if the shape's right, I can do the rest of it. Yeah. You know, so for him, that's the most important thing because yep. in his head, he's, He's at that same school and his head is viewing distance is a foot and a half to two feet. Mm -hmm. And in a foot and a half to two feet, what are you really looking at? Are you looking at the overall shape of the aircraft or the ship or whatever? Or are you looking at the instrument panel? I like, you can't see the instrument panel from two feet away. Right. Well, you can't, yep. but you, you know, so <coughs> excuse me, that's, that's where he's coming from. Right. Well, yeah. I think I think you said it uh, at the beginning. Um, people build a lot. Well, mostly these days, me included, for photography. Yeah. They build. They build to take pictures Spencer of their Pollard. stuff. Spencer Pollard said that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. We build to take pictures of it and to share it with people online or to put it on a video. Right. And so the finishing aspect has become way more visible and important. So that's bred, uh, well, a lot of products and a lot of people pushing their products, doing demos of their products and everything else. Right. And after a while, just like when I first first started getting into it, it's like, okay, this is the way people are doing it. So I'm going to try this and did a lot of it. But then I, you know, backed off and it's like, well, that's looks really sweet. And it looks really cool. I mean, Cause I've seen some stuff that's just like, it's like <laughs> they've painted it, but they painted it in a way like one of those really vivid uh, filters you have on your smartphone. It's mm -hmm. just like crack and it looks I mean, it looks really, really cool. I mean, yeah. it's like, holy, sm that thing, I hate to use the word because it's for everybody use, but it's the only one that fits. It pops. I mean, it's like, boom. It's like right there in your eyes. And then, you know, but it all boils down to what the person wants to do. Are right. you wanting to go for a lot of techniques and apply a lot of techniques to your kit, to every kit? Or do you want to go for, um, uh, for lack of a better phrase, and I, this this makes it sound like there's two camps, but more realism, utilizing some of those techniques. Right. 
you know, that's what I've tried to start doing is like quit worrying so much about techniques and go a little bit more for, you know, what I think looks realistic. Right. 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 I was, as you were talking about you doing, you know, like specific color palettes or whatever, but the whole point of this was to do black and white. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> you know? Man. So it's, it's, it's all grays and white. And there's actually, well, there's a little bit of black, but that's it's, pretty cool. And, you know, it was fun because it was one of these, it was a club thing. You know, everybody got, we got, it was a grab bag build. So, so the, the local hobby shop owner had taken a bunch of kits like this <laughs> and put them in brown lunch sacks and you had to pick one off the table and whatever was in it. You yeah. Had to build it. And so I'm like, I'm going to do it in black and white. Frankenstein, <laughs> yeah. man. And it was like, and, and at first it was kind of like, well, that sounds kind of stupid, but I think it came out kind of cool. I was like, you know what? And, uh, um, but yeah, you know, things like that, absolutely, um, are fun, but, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, again, do what you want, do what you want, but everybody would... out there, <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah, we're do your thing, you either way, it doesn't matter, and uh, it, either way sounds weird, because there's all kinds of stuff in between, right. this is just, just discussion, talking about our thoughts, I guess what I would and... say, I guess what I would say is if you're going to go on a forum or something, you're going to post a picture of your model and, and ask for opinions. Um, I would, I would say, you know, you need to be aware that, that, you know, do you want an opinion about how realistic it is or, or how cool it is? Because it's two different things. Yeah. You know, and, and you'll get them both. I, you know, but yeah. I think people gravitate toward, you know, um, groups that they relate to yes which is you know which is cool because you know like like minds you know it's like everybody can look and get you know different ideas for doing their thing but you know yeah I, there was a discussion on one of the groups that i'm in that, and i think it was some fairly new person that brought up today and, and said you know basically pretty much said you know well if you if if kind of wanting to know what the code of conduct was i think you know but really yeah. kind of saying well you know if you're posting your pictures and stuff and you're asking people what they think shouldn't you expect some feedback <laughs> you know and and well yeah you should but you know everybody's different and i mean i can i can take a punch to the gut go ahead yeah but but not but that's not everybody's thing you know i don't I don't mind somebody looking at something and saying, well, you know, this is messed up and you got a, you, you got a seam here and, 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 you know, your finish isn't smooth here or whatever. And, and, you, and usually I already know that. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. Usually by the time you get done, it's like, oh man. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of times when it comes to something like that or a, or a contest, it's like, you're just going, you're just like, okay, well, I, you're just counting on them not noticing things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's the truth. You know? Yeah. But anyway, I think we're off topic. <laughs> yeah, we are. That happens pretty frequently, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, no, good, that was. Uh, talked that was, in a while, so it's good talking to you. Yeah, that's what happens when people have to work for a living. There, yeah. Pal. No, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I just kind of so everybody can work and I'm working um, second shift. So um, it's kind of hard for us to coordinate right now because um, I'm working while a lot of people are sleeping. <laughs> yeah. I like it like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, I guess just to wrap it up is. Uh, um, you know, as we said at the beginning, this is weathering versus realism and maybe we should have said art artisticness versus realism is that a word artisticness it is now it is now yeah <laughs> yeah i think that's i think that's a good way of saying it because you know the two different 
you know, there's the artistic way of doing things and then there's, and then everything in between. Yeah. And, and n- n- none of them are, you know, wrong and none of them are necessarily right. It's just, it's your choice. Do what you want to do. Yep. And we're because just, there's room at the table for everybody. Yeah. And I, yeah, right. Exactly. And I would say um, if you're not evolving, and this is my opinion, but I would say if you're not really evolving over your modeling journey, you're probably missing out on a lot. There's so yeah, because it's fun to try new 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 stuff, yeah. you know. And and like Brett and I have said, we've kind of gone full circle, you know, and, and we've kind of tried it all and, and and may head back the other way at some point. Yeah, who knows? We just go around the circle again. Like who knows? I mean, there's people talking about doing crazy things like, you know add Zimmer to aircraft and stuff like that. Yeah, I heard something like that today from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd get some eyeballs open. <laughs> Looky here. This it is a BF, a BF 109 Mark 1. <laughs> With the waffle pattern Zimmer. <laughs> Look at the gears turning. <laughs> All right, sir. <laughs> hey. We better cool. stop. We come up with some total nonsense. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's getting late. All right. <laughs> My hey, brain's shutting down. Thanks for joining us for another Chatterbox. And uh, yes, as usual, take care of the people you love. And we'll see you all later. <laughs>